This video was brought to you by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum, as well as GE Steeplecab, a member of my Discord server. Links to the museum and server are in the video description. More on that after this video. On a cold February morning, museum staff at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum woke up to this. The roof of the roundhouse mostly gone, as tons of inches of snow had dumped all across the Baltimore area from a previous blizzard. Not only was the property heavily damaged, but several locomotives and rolling stock were inside, and people had to wonder if anything could be done to save such historic artifacts as old as the 19th century, let alone if the roundhouse itself could be repaired. The Baltimore and Ohio Rare Museum sits on what was once the old Montclair Station and adjacent roundhouse. It retains 40 acres of the B&O sprawling Montclair shop site, which is where, in 1829, the Baltimore and Ohio began America's first railroad and oldest railroad manufacturing complex in the United States. It is also said to be the birthplace of American railroading as the site of the first regular passenger service in the United States, beginning on May 22, 1830. It was also here where the first telegraph message, What Hath Got Wrought, was sent on May 24, 1844 from Washington, D.C. using Samuel L. Morse's electric telegraph. Unlike most railroads, as modernization progressed, the Baltimore, Ohio had been saving some of their older locomotives and other artifacts for public relations purposes, with many of them dating back to the 19th century. This collection was stored in various places until the railroad eventually decided to centralize it in a permanent home. That home eventually became the Roundhouse itself, which opened as the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad Museum on July 4th, 1953. The Roundhouse not only served as the home of many historical locomotives, rolling stock, and artifacts, but also as the main entrance to the museum and the adjacent North Car shops also housed more artifacts. Some of the artifacts hosted in the museum include, but not limited to, the Baltimore, Ohio William Mason, an 1856 built 440, famous for its appearance in the Great Locomotive Chase and later Wild Wild West. A 1927 replica of the Baltimore, Ohio Tom Thumb, one of the first operational steam locomotives in the country. Baltimore, Ohio 260-600, J.C. Davis, built at Montclair in 1875, which won the first prize in the 1876 Centennial Exposition. C&J Box Cab 1000, the first commercially successful diesel locomotive built in 1925, and many, many more. The roundhouse contains 22 bays with a turntable in the middle. Surrounding that is 22 brick wall panels forming a 240 feet diameter outer circle and a 100 feet inner circle formed by the 22 iron support beams that align radially with the exterior walls. Although that said outer circle was more like a 22 sided pentagon or an icosidagon. The roof begins at the top of the exterior walls and rises upward at a two horizontal to one vertical slope to intersect with the columns at around 62 feet above the floor. From there, an 18 foot tall exterior wall within the circular plane of the columns forms, which makes up the clear story. This contains windows that serve to ventilate the building and provide natural illumination inside. At the top of the clear story wall, 80 feet above the floor, is the upper roof. It rises at the same vertical and horizontal slope for another 15 feet to a timber compression ring that provides support not just for the top of the upper roof, but a 26 feet diameter wooden structure known as the lantern, which contains more windows for lighting and ventilation, hence its name. Finally on top is the dome cap of the lantern that seals the structure and is 122 feet above the ground. For decades, this roof safely protected the locomotives and other artifacts below safe from the elements. That is, until one day.
tonight digging out from one of the worst blizzards in the tri-state's history and it will take days until things are back to normal. Plus, firefighters in Queens tonight battling a five alarm blaze in the worst of conditions. Pretty nifty. The wind chill's about zero. So far at Reagan, last check, 11.2 inches. So right now, we're only two and a half inches from putting this storm in the record book as number 10. As if the roads aren't bad enough in this part of the Poconos, visibility is also next to none. The worst north storm to hit the area in seven years has buried the tri state region in knee deep snow. The snow is still falling tonight, but the end is in sight. That's the good news. Yeah. Well, the state of emergency remains in effect in Delaware tonight, and that means only emergency and snow removal personnel are legally allowed to drive on Delaware roads. I should have stayed in California. It didn't snow out there. <laughs> Doing prior to this storm, we'd only had 22 inches of snow for the entire winter season. We doubled that one in this day as well. The winner is Monroe in Orange County, New York, with 30 inches of snow. But in general, the range was 18 to 26 inches across the area that's shown in white now. As the snow pulls away, we're left to 12 to 18 inches, including the eastern end of Long Island and this edge right on the Jersey Shore line and on up the Hudson Valley. Starting on Valentine's Day, February 14th, to around the 19th of 2003, a devastating blizzard struck the Northeast. This storm, known as President's Day Storm 2, or PD2, was one of the worst blizzards in U.S. history, dumping as much as 15 to 30 inches of snow from Boston to Washington, D.C. Boston and Baltimore in particular got some of the worst of the storm, with just over 28 inches of snow hitting these cities in particular, the largest ever recorded in their respective cities' histories, especially Baltimore. This blizzard came from a low pressure weather system that came from the south and moved to the northeast, gaining strength. The museum took a direct hit from the blizzard as the northeast winds drove the snow from the east and north faces of the lower and upper roof and deposited it to the south and west portions, causing giant snowdrifts to form, often said to be the largest to ever form on top of the roundhouse, measuring nearly four to six feet tall in total. This proved to eventually be too much as the top cords of several truss girders buckled and as a result, the roof began to collapse. The first part of the roof collapse occurred at 11.45 p.m. on February 16, 2003, involving bays 15 and 16. As the roof fell, it triggered the sprinkler system alarms, alerting night crews at the museum that something was wrong. The next day, at 5.20 a.m., the second collapse occurs, this time involving bays 6 to 10. And then, just before 10 a.m., three hours later, the third and final collapse occurred at bays 11 to 16. The rest of the roof, however, survived and didn't collapse. But unfortunately, the damage was done as snow, slate shingles, decking, iron trusses, and splinters of wood fell on top of the rolling stock and locomotives below. To make matters worse, the collapse also snapped a 3 inch diameter natural gas line that supplied the HVAC equipment for the roundhouse, creating the risk of an explosion and fire, but thankfully, neither occurred. A 6 inch sprinkler main also broke, triggering the fire alarms, activating the fire pump, and flooding the museum and turntable pit with water, and melting snow only made it worse. As for the rolling stock and locomotives, Many had varying forms of damage. These included BNO 460147, the Thatcher Perkins, numbered 117 at the time, BNO 460305, the Camel, numbered 217 at the time, BNO 280545, the AJ Cromwell, BNO 08057, the Memnon. BNO Derrick Crane D2, BNO Wooden Caboose 2222, two BNO Hand Pump Track Cars 1 and 2, Pair Marquette SW111, BNO Iron Box Car 17000, St. Elizabeth No. 4, nicknamed Little Lizzie. 
BNO wooden coach 20. BNO 260600, the JC Davis, among other rolling stock and equipment. A total of approximately 18 displays. The sight of the damage was certainly sobering as it was catastrophic. Frederick N. Rasmussen, who wrote an article for the Baltimore Sun, recalled, We peered through windows to the museum floor where debris that covered locomotives and cars was being sprinkled by snow particles drifting from the open roof. Twisted and mangled columns of steel beams, heaps of brick and timbers added to the forlorn scene. None of us wanted to utter the words that were surely ricocheting through our hearts and minds. Was this the end of the museum? Many people did share that concern, but many were also wondering how could this happen? The cause of the collapse wasn't just because of the snow, but also a few factors in the construction of the roof, such as no lateral bracing for the bottom cords of the truss girders that help hold the roof in place. Without that brace in the original design, this caused the wood deck roofing to slowly shift sideways over the course of 119 years, ever since being designed by famed architect Ephraim Francis Baldwin. Plus, the use of mostly iron, not heavier steel for the support columns, as structured steel technology was in its infancy at the time, were also contributing factors in the collapse. But either way, four to six feet of snow is certainly one hell of a load to put on your roof, no matter how old it is. After the collapse, in order to hold up the structure to prevent further damage, temporary shoring towers and hold down cables were installed to hold the structure in place along with temporary bracing wires, wall braces, and removing the windows and the lantern to reduce wind pressure, especially with more high winds on the way after the collapse. Thankfully, all these parts did their job and work soon started on rebuilding the roof. However, even the surviving roof panels had to be taken apart, so plywood scaffolding and plexiglass shields were erected to shield the locomotives still inside. Once the new roof, including building a new lantern, was hoisted up, work started on restoring the damaged displays. Unfortunately, some wooden rolling stock were a total loss, as it'd be impossible to restore them without making them mere replicas. One of these casualties was B&O Coach No. 20, as it was nearly totally destroyed in the collapse. Her sister, Coach number 21 survived as it was untouched by the collapse, but not wanting to let the good parts go to waste, stuff like 20's trucks, balance beam, and floor assembly were donated to the Northwest Pacific Railroad Historical Society so they could use them to rebuild Central Pacific Coach number 29, which bears similarities to 20 and was built around the same time. In terms of locomotives though, pretty much all of them were restored to their former glory, even 600, who was the main casualty in the incident and suffered some of the worst damage. Well, mostly original. B&O 217, the Camel, was renumbered to 305, and Thatcher Perkins was renumbered from 117 to 147, its original number funny enough. And today? 20 years later, you would have never known the roof had crashed down in the first place. A very special thanks goes to the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad Museum for making this video possible. The museum has kept up on their ongoing goal to preserve and restore railroad history from long ago to give you an in-depth look of railroading in the Golden Age. You can help the museum continue in their goal by donating to them. Donating helps power the heart of the museum, helping them bring award-winning educational programming and exhibitions, create insightful tours, one-of-a-kind experiences, and of course, support the care and restoration of the museum's collection at the birthplace of American Railroading. Consider donating to the museum by using the following link in the video description. You know what they say, a little penny can go a long way. Oh, and if you're in the area, Consider visiting the museum yourself, and perhaps either becoming a member, or even volunteering your time to help out the museum with restoration projects. 
If you want to learn more about the museum roof collapse, also consider picking up the book, Tragedy to Triumph, written by William B. Rocky and Pamela S. Coleman, who both helped in rebuilding the roundhouse roof. The book goes into much more detail, mainly from an engineering standpoint, on how the roundhouse was rebuilt. Be sure to visit the museum's website, not just to donate, but to also schedule your visit, check out upcoming events, and more. A very special thanks also goes to Jonathan Goldman, the chief curator at the Baltimore Ohio Rare Museum, for his help in making this video possible, and GE Steeplecab for requesting this video in my Discord server, link to which is also in the video description. Thanks for watching this video, we'll see you next time.